<laughs> Have to get that cocoon in the in the in the bathtub, you know. No water bursts, I guess. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, it's time. So, um, welcome everybody, and thank you for tuning in to our live Q and A on Discover Wonder: The Octopus Garden, one of the amazing films that we have in this year's International Ocean Film Festival. Joining us today, we have John Dutton, the director of the film, as well as two scientists with the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, Dr. Chad King and Dr. Jennifer Brown, uh, whose voices and ideas are featured in the film. The Oct Discover Wonder Octopus Garden film tells the story of a new discovery on a seamount just off the coast of California a few years ago of an amazing octopus garden. It was the footage shows ecosystems in the deep sea that are little known and little explored. And so I want to start with a question to John Dutton. Um, this film was made about an amazing discovery, an amazing place, but it's a pretty inaccessible place. It's difficult to get down there. It's difficult to get footage. Um, it's difficult to be able to tell the stories of the deep sea. Can you share with us a little bit about the challenges of making a film about what's happening in the deep ocean and what you learned throughout that journey? Hi. Um, yeah, well, it was uh, thanks to the great work and the amazing footage um, that uh, Chad was able to provide. First of all, he filmed himself much along, along the way in, um, when he went down into the uh, Alvin and of course that in itself, and he'll probably tell you those challenges. Um, and uh, Nautilus Live, the Ocean Exploration Trust, as well as Woods Hole uh, Institution, without their footage uh, and their documentation of their work, this film would not be possible. And it really is truly amazing work. And th the amount of technology that goes into an expedition like this um, is incredible. I touched a little bit upon, you know, some of the, the technology that was used in the film. Um, and you see that, you know, you have an ROV that's equipped with multiple cameras, but everything is fed into a control room. And you have a team of people who are there just documenting and, 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 and making notes and, and and there's this massive coordination that, that goes on there. And I, I should leave that uh, experience to Chad and Jen because they're, they're the ones who, who are there. But I have to say that this was a, a truly remote production in every sense of the word, you know, uh, especially due to COVID. And, you know, I never met uh, Chad in person or, or Jen. So uh, this was kind of a truly uh, challenging experience just in making the film. And of course, you know, Chad, uh, normally I would be there and film him in person and do the interviews and everything um, and do uh, the technical setup for narration and whatnot. And again, Chad had to uh, do everything uh, at home and um, he, he did all the narrations and everything um, from home. Uh, so I sent him the scripts and everything. So a lot of challenges that we had to, uh, a lot of hurdles that we had to uh, get over. Well, it, it seems definitely that you surpassed all those hurdles and, and the end product is an amazing way to bring this remote ecosystem over to audiences all around the world, thousands of people that are tuning into the Ocean Film Festival, but I'm sure beyond there, many more people will learn about the Octopus Garden. I'll touch on a point now that, that John mentioned, this film was particularly remote <laughs> because of COVID, but deep ocean exploration has always been somewhat remote, um, whether it's you know uh, from a, a boat Rem uh, operating a remotely operating operated vehicle or in recent years also scientists from around the world tuning in to live streams showing what's being seen um, from an ROV or a manned submersible. 
So uh, Jen, would, would you want to uh, share with us a little bit about the challenges of, of deep sea exploration and how uh, working remotely uh, has, has always been embedded in it, but perhaps is supercharged now? Yeah, so um, as you're saying, most of the footage, um, apart from the footage that was taken when Chad and the team were down in the Alvin, is taken by underwater robots called ROVs. Um, so they're being operated by a team aboard the vessel and they're two miles down underwater and we're getting live stream video footage. We're sitting on board the ship and um, in a room with you know, the video engineers and the ROV pilots and the science team and the navigators all coordinating how to move those um, ROVs across the seafloor um, to, well, in this case, we're exploring new areas. So we have some maps and then we just have to see what we see and, and see whether we're going to stick to our plan. Or if we see something like the octopus garden completely unexpected, we throw the plan out immediately and start coming up with a new plan and um, follow the kind of breadcrumbs before us to try and figure it out. In this case, uh, when we're on the Nautilus, we have the ability to have scientists on shore who are communicating with us through a chat. Um, and so we were lucky to have a geologist in the chat when we found the octopus garden who helped us figure out um, some ideas of what might be going on and allowed us to go from finding a small grouping of the octopus to actually discovering some of the vast um, fields of octopus. Um, so we were always working kind of in, with some remote scientists but then this past fall, we went back out um, virtually, mostly with the Nautilus um, team. And uh, I was in this room, my office, um, leading the expedition, um, you know, with I had multiple screens set up. We had the chat going, sometimes our audio, most of the time the audio was working every now and then we couldn't actually hear each other. And so then we were commuting, it was very, interesting to be doing that remotely um, this year. Uh, but it really does show how we can leverage all this technology to do a better job of exploring these new uh, kind of remote and unknown places. It's really fun. Sorry, thank you, Jen. It's great to hear that uh, exploration has been able to continue even with the challenges that we've faced this year. I want to come back to, to kind of this discovery uh, of the octopus garden. You mentioned it was unexpected. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about the history of, of the, you know, the first observation of this amazing octopus garden at the base of Davidson Seamount and how you've studied it since? That Did you want me or, or Jen to take that? Uh, Chad, uh, can you go first and uh, then Jen can add? Oh, sure, no problem. I just want to... Make sure. So um, back in 2018 was our first expedition aboard the exploration vessel Nautilus, and it truly is an exploration vessel. And we had previously been out to Davidson Seamount, which is an extinct volcano about two miles under the surface of the ocean. Its summit is only about uh, maybe a half a mile. It's about 8,000 feet tall, so it's almost as tall as the Sierra Mountains, if you want to you know, contextualize it in that regard for people who are familiar in California. So it's a very large mountain on the, on the seafloor itself. Back in 2002 was our first expedition with Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute in which we discovered these massive long-lived corals and sponges all over the seamount and subsequent expeditions really, really cataloged a lot of those special organisms to the point where we added the Davidson Seamount to Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary in 2008 to protect those corals from potentially future mining activities where uh, miners would go out there and scrape the seafloor and maybe you know rip up corals that are hundreds if not thousands of years old. So we wanted to make sure to protect that. Well, part of our charge as the research team for Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary is to explore new areas within our sanctuary and to characterize our sanctuary. Basically understand what exactly are we protecting? What is out there? It's really difficult to, to you know, explore the seafloor. We have over 6,000 miles of sanctuary seafloor out there. We can't see every square foot. It's just not possible. But we try to dabble and take peeks into every representative habitat, if you will. Well, one of those areas we had never really explored 
was kind of off the base of the mountain, kind of the flatlands, the plains, the foothills of Davidson Seamount. And there are a lot of interesting rocky features there where typically corals and sponges will attach to rocks, that they, they prefer that kind of habitat. So we thought it would be a good idea to go out there and explore. And so that was kind of the impetus of going out with uh, Ocean Exploration Trust. It was true exploration and it was characterization of our sanctuary. Well, when we got out there, uh, the thing that's beautiful about these ROVs with the Exploration Vessel Nautilus is they can stay out there for literally days at a time. Whereas a man submersible, you're limited to human endurance and safety, where maybe you can only be underwater for eight to 12 hours. The robots can stay in there underwater for really perpetuity, but practically at least a few days. So we have these uh, shifts that rotate every four hours, 24 hours a day. So we're exploring 24 seven. It's really remarkable. So it was the end of a 30 plus hour dive. We'd been going for more than a day solid and Jennifer and I were actually on shift together when we came across this little population of about 20 or so octopus. And we thought it was very peculiar because octopus are solitary animals normally. And this looked like a congregation of them. And as we sat the ROV down, we noticed shimmering in the water, kind of like heat off the pavement on a sunny day or on a, on a summer day. And then we noticed, so that, that suggested heat, warmth coming from the seafloor. Uh, and then we noticed some of the uh, eggs that were underneath these octopus. You could see behind me the very odd position. They look like flowers in a way, kind of upside down inverted. So this was all new to me and Jennifer. We're not cephalopod experts. So we were really trying to figure out what was going on. And this is part of the excitement and you know the frustration of the unknown. It was like, what is going on? We need to know. Uh, and as Jennifer said, we had the help of, of people on shore, including a geologist who said, well, maybe you should look down slope a little bit. There might be some more of this warm water or effluent or something coming out of the seafloor and maybe we'll find more octopus there. We had no idea. <laughs> this is all within one hour, mind you, of the final hour of this 30 hour dive. And that's when we just saw thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And it was just remarkable. We knew we found something special. Um, and that just really kicked off the last two and a half plus years of multiple expeditions, not just with Ocean Exploration Trust, but with Woods Hole and the Alvin and even Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. So it's just been, I mean, we're still sitting on a pile of data and video and observations. This is going to take many, many years to process. Uh, not only that, but, but plan future expeditions, not only to Davidson and surrounding areas, because we've since discovered a second large octopus population six miles away from the original. And we've counted them, over 3,600 octopus at that new location, which Jen dubbed the Octocone. We like, we like our, our names, Octopus Garden, Oct Octocone. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, as you can tell, I'm, I get excited about this stuff. So we have a, lot, <laughs> a really exciting future ahead of us, uh, but a lot of uh, information to still sort through. That's, that's great. And it sounds like it was such an exciting experience to be there when you first observed the octopus garden. Uh, Jen, how did, how did that feel to come across that first population of 20 octopus and then start finding hundreds and hundreds of them? Well, Chad was generous to say it was on both of our watches. I believe my watch ended just as we were finding these things. And I was like, Chad, can I stay? <laughs> I didn't want to leave. <laughs> so um, he let me stick around and up in the control room. So it was fun to get to do, to do this together. And um, another neat thing was that the uh, Nautilus is live streamed on the internet so that anyone at home can be watching in real time what we're finding, what, the, what we're seeing. And um, there's a person who's part of the team called the Science Communication Fellow. And they can see how many people are tuning into the live stream and people can submit questions. And they started telling us like, it was catchy, like people were tweeting it out. People were coming to the live stream. It was just like all this excitement was building. We found out then that um, word got out to Monterey Bay Sanctuary's office. They were in like a staff meeting or something and they turned on the live stream and they were contacting people at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. They were popping in. And so it was just really fun to be in this community of discovery with all that is facilitated by the the um, telepresence that they do. And so, and as Chad said, we were getting input from people also of trying to help us understand what we were seeing and where we should go and look next. 
um, to try and do as much as we could to characterize and understand what we had found in that hour that was remaining. I mean, we were asked, can we stay down longer? Do we really have to pull the ROVs? But we had a hard stop. So we did have to leave when we left that first time, but it was, um, and that it was right after, I think, that one of the ROV pilots knew the person who had found um, the only other instance of these group things of these octopus off of Costa Rica. Um, so immediately we start, like after we started getting input on what had been seen in one other place and we could start comparing and thinking about um, what to do next to better understand what was going on. It was really fun and exciting. Yeah, well, it, it sounds like that discovery was a, a true kind of virtual uh, party and celebration with people tuning in from all around and being able to participate in, in that process of, uh, of exploring and learning about the deep sea. John, as you embarked on the journey of, of making this film, um, you had to, in some ways, put yourself in the, in the shoes of a scientist, learn a lot about the deep sea, to learn about the significance of the different um, things that, that uh, were shown in the film. Could you tell us in that journey as you were learning, what are some of the uh, takeaways that stick with you about the deep sea, about the octopus garden in particular, and uh, about how little we know? Well, yeah, there is a lot of research that needs to be done. I mean, these guys have been doing it all their life. So it's uh, second nature to them. As a filmmaker, when you start a new project, you have to do a lot of research. And for me, I had to put myself into uh, the position of Chad. What would he say? What would he experience? And so uh, it was a very immersive, uh, ex immersive research for me. And I almost feel like I had to do like a, a PhD in, in, in um, oceanography uh, almost overnight. But uh, over, the, over, over the weeks of uh, scouring through all the information, you kind of get through um, and you absorb a lot of uh, the information. And uh, the thing I think that most resonated to me was the fact that everything that happened down in the deep has an influence or influences our climate. And, and that to me was just mind blowing to think that something two, three miles down can, can impact, have an impact on our, on our climate. Um, that I think was, was probably the most, I mean, apart from this discovery um, of, of the octopus and to see them uh, just operating down there under these pressures and this temperatures. And I mean, it's just unbelievable to think that there's life, there's so much life down there, so much life. Yeah, that's fascinating. And it's really a stark reminder of how interconnected we all are, not just to each other, but the, the ecosystems, even in the deep sea that impact our lives. Um, and I think also, I mean, I think the, the whale fall is also a classic example of, um, you know, th th there's this, this gift from, from above, you know, and, and settles. And how on earth do they find that? You know, all these, all these octopus, they, the fish and everything, they just sense there's something there and they find it, you know. So there's this dynamic movement going on. And those, those are just amazing. And I think, you know, um, six months later or a year later, uh, the team went down there to look at the uh, whale fall again, and it was a completely different scene. Yes, that was yeah. just this past October that we went back a year later. And, and it, uh, I think we were really surprised um, at how much it had changed in that year. Um, so it was really great to get to, to go back and see how things are. Um, uh, like, I think we think of the deep sea and it does in some ways is kind of in slow motion, but yet at the same time, um, a lot of dynamic things are happening. I think that that's an important thing to remember. There are animals that live very long lifestyle, uh, life spans, uh, some of them slow growing, they're in the deep sea, they're living without any sunlight, but it's, it's a changing environment as well. And that those interactions between the biology, the geology and the chemistry in the ocean have um, impacts on, 
on everything <laughs> else there. Um, so you mentioned, uh, Jen, the octopus on the whale fall. Was that the same species as the octopus that were at the octopus garden? Yes, it was. And so that was the first. Well, we had seen this species one or here and there, um, but it was the, uh, a, a kind of a, a nice surprise to see. We were wondering what they do when they're not uh, brooding in these large aggregations. So it was um, really interesting to see them on the whale fall. Um, as adults, we still have no idea what they do between hatching and uh, being adults on, the, on foraging on the seafloor. So that's a big mystery that we're still trying to figure out. We know they hatch and they swim up into the water column and then it's a black box for us until we find them when they're adults. So that's definitely one of our big questions. I think we've figured out why they swim up. Um, and if anyone has had a chance to see some of the footage, um, there are predators hanging out in, an, in and amongst the mother octopus shrimp that um, if an egg is left untended, will try to consume either the egg or the hatchling. So it makes sense that they leave the seafloor right away and that's their instinct to do that, but then we don't know where they go. Yeah, that, that battle between the small shrimp and, and baby octopus that just hatched in the, in the film was a really dramatic moment. Um, so amazing that, that you could capture something so small, so far deep into the ocean and be able to observe um, what's happening. Chad, you mentioned that there had been some exploration of this seamount, Davidson seamount, that found deep sea corals and sponges, um, but the octopus garden wasn't known. And so I wonder if you can speak a little bit more to that element of getting the seamount included in the sanctuary, making sure that it was protected and what that's meant um, to be able to make more discoveries around that area. Yeah, like I had mentioned before, when we had made those discoveries with Mbari uh, regarding the corals and the sponges, there was a federal effort. Well, it started grassroots, but came a federal effort to add that area. Just we knew that deep sea mining at the time in the early 2000s wasn't feasible in terms of profit yet. But even though we added that portion to the sanctuary in 2008, here we are in the year 2021, and deep sea mining is actually becoming very feasible and very profitable in other areas of the world. So it was kind of like setting Yellowstone aside long before uh, a lot of people always wonder, well, if there's no immediate threat, why are you protecting it? And it's like, that's the exact point, because right now we're not going to be impacting a company's bottom line, right? There's not going to be any of those those financial reasons to not do it as far as pressure coming back on us. So it was pretty win-win uh, for everyone. And once we added that portion to our sanctuary, of course, like I said before, we had to go uh, characterize it. But one of the things that was interesting is that, again, we had no idea about these processes happening uh, on the seafloor that deep. The entire central coast of California, we have things called cold seeps, which are uh, little cracks in the seafloor where methane is coming out. And certain organisms will use methane instead of sunlight to derive their energy from with symbiotic relationships with bacteria that, that use the methane, metabolize the methane. I, I don't wanna get too deep into the science there, but we didn't have any examples of warm water coming out. That, you gotta go really far north, you gotta go to mid-Atlantic ridges or volcanic areas, right? And so seeing this was, out of context, Jen, like I said, Jen and I were like, what is going on here? Why is why is the water appear to be warm? And the other frustrating part is we couldn't access our thermometer on the ROV, so we couldn't confirm it, right? And, and this tells a little bit about the frustrations and the challenges of deep sea exploration. It's really hard to get out there. Everything has to go right, right? It takes in a massive team of experts and people to support this from the ROV pilots, navigators, engineers, the people who prep and clean the ROV, the scientists, the biologists, uh, the, you know, the crew members who operate the vessel, right? Uh, who make the food, who clean the vessel. It goes on and on and on, all for you know uh, a dive or two uh, on a particular uh, exploration vessel. We um, had some technical challenges which didn't allow us to, to go right back to the octopus garden uh, after that first dive, which was Im immensely frustrating because we had made this great discovery. It was like, 
It was like being a kid at Christmas and just starting to open up that present you want. And then you're like, ah, I can't play with it. And you got to put it away, you know, for months. Um, that's what it felt like. But at least we found something and we knew it was there. Uh, so, you know, all of those emotions are, are running through. You're, you're trying to be scientific about it and try to understand it. But we're all human. And Jen and I and the whole team, and like she said, everybody who was tuning in, was just immensely excited about, is this really happening? We thought we knew this area really well. And Bari has been doing deep sea exploration here for you know 30 years. How come no one's ever found this before? Mm -hmm. But that also tells the story of even in a relatively well-researched area, there's plenty to discover. Worldwide, we've explored less than 5% of the world's seafloor and less than 1% of the living space when you consider you know, the depths of the ocean we have still discovered so much less or explored so much less than the surface of the moon. So I think that ties into the importance of being able to go out and, and do this kind of exploration, even in our backyard, because this stuff happens all the, you know, I shouldn't say all the time, but it happens often enough to really uh, uh, give us the reasons and the financial means to go out there and find this stuff. Well, and like Chad said, we couldn't go dive back right away and and it was going to take months to get back out there and people were like where will there will they still be there yeah. you know we're like I, I hope so uh but you know we didn't know if all the moms came at one time and laid the eggs all at the same time or if this was kind of an ongoing um uh, phenomenon that was gonna that we'd be able to see when the next time we came back it, it wasn't known for certain so when Chad got to go back and confirm they were still there, <laughs> that was that was a great piece of information. It seems so simple, but yet so important. That's such a powerful reminder of how little we really know about the deep ocean that in a place like the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, that's among the most explored places in the ocean at all, you could still be making pretty massive discoveries um, this light. So I, I uh, want to come back to that, that kind of sense of, um, depending on the, the article and the report, almost every dive to the deep sea, there's new discoveries of species, there's um, potentially phenomenons that haven't been observed before. And uh, in I think a Hawkeye magazine article, there's an estimate of up to 80% uh, of what scientists are seeing on some of the deep sea dives might be unknown to science. Um, so I wonder if if Chad and Jennifer, you could expand on you know the experience of, of Davidson, what that tells us about how much more we need to explore the other seamounts and, and areas off the coast of the US. There's about 60 seamounts off the coast of California uh, that, as I understand, have been little explored. So could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, as far as you know, discovering something new on every dive, that's, there's no doubt about that. You just may not know it right away. We have a lot of video, of course, that needs to be studied further. I mean, just hours and hours and hours of video, hundreds of hours of video. Um, secondarily, we have a lot of uh, samples that has, have been taken. And a lot of those samples are sent out to experts who either requested them or if we are requesting identification. And so a lot of that work still kind of remains to be done because of the pandemic and slowing down a lot of that stuff. Um, you know, in particular, like for example, the octopus garden here, um, there are a lot of the larger, more parent organisms that we see. The octopus are fairly cosmopolitan. It's a known species. A lot of the other species that we see in terms of the shrimp and the anemones are, are known. They're general to that area, not in these congregations, of course, around warm water seeps, but there's a lot of the little animals within the cracks and crevices of these octopus gardens amongst all the other habitat that we explored as well. And there's no doubt there's plenty of species to name by science in that. It's a balance of how much time and effort you have to dedicate to, you know, maybe sampling every little worm, every little crustacean, that you find in identifying them, you know, through science. So I, I would not doubt that 80% number. I know that with the whale fall, for example, that in itself was another tremendous, just accidental discovery. In fact, at that point, um, we had been going along this large, lo very long, we were on it for almost a day and a half, practically, of these large um, 
sedimentary cliffs, kind of look like the desert Southwest with these buttes and, and cliff sides and everything. A lot of interesting geology there. And we had to cut it short because we identified this volcanic cone, which eventually we did find a, another population of octopus. And that was our, our theory was like, maybe there's another portion of the seafloor where water's getting squirted out. And if so, maybe there's more octopus there. So we decided to cut the current dive short. And so we could transit over about a mile, uh, about two miles to the octocone. And on transit, they asked, well, do you want to go a little faster and stay above the seafloor and like go through the midwater? Or do you want to go a little slower, but able to see the bottom? And I looked at the maps and we, it looked like it was mostly going to be mud or soft sediment. Now, most of the time, yeah, it's true. You're not going to see a lot of exciting quote unquote things on mud or soft sediment. But I said, and we kind of had a discussion. It was like, well, let's just, you know, let's just keep along the bottom. It only cost us a half an hour or something like that. And I'm so glad we did because I mean, talk about serendipity. That is something that we had no idea. That's not on a map. We didn't know it was going to be there. We could have been a couple hundred yards to the south or north of it and never seen it. But we happened to be driving right into it. And the navigator said, oh, we have something on radar or sonar. And sure enough, that was a fairly fresh uh, a minky whale. We didn't know it was minky at the time. We had ideas that it might have been. Um, but one of the things that we saw immediately on there were these little flower fuzzy things off the bone. And we knew immediately those were called bone eating worms. And these are specialized worms that don't have a gut and they have symbiotic bacteria living within their uh, uh, body cavity. And they basically metabolize uh, the oils that are digested or I should say chemically digested. And um, they produce the carbon that the, the worm eats. So the worm prov provides the housing for the bacteria. The bacteria provides the food for the worm. Those things were only discovered in 2002. And we saw many different varieties on the whale. So we were able to sample them, um, contact experts in bone eating worms while we're on site. And I was like, Jennifer, keep them on the whale. I gotta go make some phone calls. So <laughs> Jen was it like, was, can we do crazy. another pass of the video of the thing and whatever? So it was like this stall tactic to try and get the people that we needed <laughs> Anyway, long story short, uh, we ended up collecting some of the, the worms according to the way we should, preserved them, and then sent them to the experts. And already we do have a brand new species of bone-eating worm. And there may be more based on the collections from this past uh, year when we went back. So these things are happening at such uh, speed, it's really hard to, to ingest them and to decide what to do and how to pivot on the fly and to understand, you know, who do we need to contact? So science in itself can be relatively, I'm not gonna say boring, but non-eventful when you're planning things. And then when everything happens at once, you gotta think on your toes and realizing, you know, you're down there two miles under the water. It's very expensive. You got all these people watching. You gotta be careful what you do and what you say. And it's, it gets really intense. Um, but you know, Jen and I and the whole team just you just get into that focus mode and you make things happen step by step and it all worked out in the end. So we're hoping that not only with the bone eating worm, but uh, other samples that we collected and, and the future video analysis will we'll tease out a few more um, animals that are new to science. Oh, I have to say, when I came off that four-hour watch, I was tired. <laughs> <laughs> Mentally exhausting is a very, yeah, good I phrase. I was so focused, yeah. intensely focused, uh, multitasking for, for four hours. And, and we're like, whew, because it's such an opportunity. You just want to get as much out of it as you can. And you're trying to get people in the science chat to contact other people and get them into the science chat or to let you know, yeah, how do we collect this for you so that you can look at it. Sometimes you have to freeze it. Sometimes you have to preserve it. Some, you know, there's just a lot of different things to figure out uh, very quickly. Yeah, as Jen said, we, you know, we have a plan and when we discover things like this, you throw it out the window and that's what it was. Cause when you're down there, you're trying to take every single minute and every opportunity to get every bit of information and science that you can out of it. And, you know, we're experts in our own fields or whatever, um, but definitely, again, not whale falls and bone eating worms and, and you know, the animals that, that graze off of it. So now we're reaching out uh, via text and email and phone and everything, trying to get everyone we can going, hey, look, 
we got this dead way. We got all these animals. What do you want? What is the best way to preserve this? What should we collect? Um, but the community is just so supportive because of course they want it. They want this stuff. They want to understand. They want more samples. It's, it's free for them. Um, and it's just, it's great to see the community come together in these uh, discoveries and OET and their telepresence really facilitated a lot of that uh, to be able to happen. Yeah. And then we still had to be, we were watching the clock because we again had a set full time and we wanted to get to that octopus that, well, what wasn't called the octopus cone yet, but to that cone <laughs> to see whether or not they're octopus. And because of the whale fall, we ended up with another situation where we had about an hour <laughs> left yeah. to figure out it, if there are octopus there or not. It was unreal that Jen and I were on shift again <laughs> at the octo cone. We discover all these octopus and we're like, oh, we got 45 minutes till pull time. So it was very, very similar to the first discovery. And we need to start designing these dives so we do the discoveries in the beginning of the dive <laughs> and not the end of dives. If only. Yeah, if only. If, if only you could get the ocean to cooperate with you on that one, Chad. <laughs> um, no, that's amazing. And, uh, you know, bone eating worms sounds so spooky, uh, but it, it's just one more example of how many amazing things there are in the ocean that we're still learning about. Uh, Jen, you shared, so you guys found this whale fall by chance as you were transiting between one place and the other. But then since you had limited time on the dive, you wanted to go back and, and learn more. Could you share with us a little bit about um, the, the process to try to find it again? And what you've been able to learn. Uh, Chad mentioned the species, and that's something that uh, maybe wasn't able to be determined the first time, but you have to go back to get different angles and confirm it. Yeah, so um, we went back a year, almost exactly a year later um, with the Nautilus again. And first we had to find the whale on the seafloor, which may sound easy, but um, in fact, positioning between the satellites and the ship and the ROVs when the ROVs are two miles below the ship, it adds some error in there. So there was a bit of a, you know, searching when we, when we did find it, there was a lot of relief amongst the whole team that there it is. And then we said, whoa, because right away we could see how much of it changed. Um, the footage that's in um, Discover Wonder, there's still quite a bit of um, flesh on the skeleton and when we returned that was all removed by the scavengers the baleen had um, started to come out uh, dissociate from the jaw and was scattered around the seafloor there were still worms but the, in the bones but in, in different densities and looked like maybe different kinds the sediments around didn't have these as thick a carpet of worms so we're just seeing a lot of different things and we kind of anticipated what changes we might see. And, but then it was a little different than we expected. So again, we're going through, okay, what do we wanna do? What do we wanna collect? We knew we wanted to be able to get um, video all around the whale again, because as Chad said, taking a bunch of video all around the whale was a stalling tactic in the first year, but it resulted, and Chad could go into this more, but um, our partners at the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute turned that into a three-dimensional model of the whale fall. And so we wanted to be able to have a, another 3D model of it a year later and, and as a way of being able to both, um, I think the public enjoys interacting with things like that, but also as, as a scientific tool to think about change. Um, and I don't know, I, I've lost track of the question a little bit, but maybe Chad, you can jump in and help me out. <laughs> but um, we did, oh, I should say that we, we did have some um, experts from the California Academy of Sciences who were helping us uh, through the science chat to identify which particular um, pieces of the whale um, that we'd gotten permits to bring in for collections, which ones to select that were gonna be the best for their scientific um, and kind of cataloging needs. So we had some additional help again because we haven't turned into whale fall experts in a year. <laughs> So we needed to have someone on hand to help us. Yeah, and that shows really uh, kind of how, how involved the process can be. You're getting the most out of everything with building these 3D models and, and getting collections from the sites. But also, uh, even with that, you might have to go back and consult with other experts to identify something as simple as the type of whale um, that that whale fall was. Uh, so really interesting process. 
I'll come back to John now that the kind of scenes that uh, Jen and Chad are describing on the boat sound very frantic, full of excitement, a lot of movement. Uh, I'm sure as, as you were going through footage and audio, um, you uh, observed a lot of these moments of people being uh, surprised and excited and reacting to discoveries in real time. In building your film and, and the narrative of your film, how did you make choices about you know what moments to include, where uh, whether to include the audio from the live, uh, you know what was happening live, or uh, stick to narration? And those editorial choices would be great to hear a little bit more from you. It was tough. Uh, it was really tough. Uh, there was so much good. Uh, media there the only thing i didn't have were any of the behind the scenes you know the actual filming of you know their reactions um and one of the limitations obviously is um the length of the film it needed to be a short film so we had to really pare it down to the absolute you know essence what is this story about what is the information that we need to get across and, um, you know, after talking with various different uh, partners, um, you know, the parameters got narrowed and narrowed and uh, we needed to just really focus on the story, the discovery, why they were going down there and uh, just bring out some of the, 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 the key points. Um, I would have loved to have uh, made this into a much longer film. It's, it's so rich in, in content, um, but unfortunately we didn't have um, the budget for it. And, and it, wasn't, it, wasn't the, the, it wasn't the mission for the film. I think, um, I think uh, we've, we, we really came down to, to the essence and I'm really proud of this film and uh, what it's doing and the, the exposure that it's getting and uh, the feedback that we're getting, it's, it's terrific. Yeah, certainly it's been a wonderful thing to be able to share with our audience and I'll make a plug for those of you listening to the Q&A live. There is an audience award at the Ocean Film Festival. So if you've had the chance to watch the films and watch Discover Wanderer, Octopus Garden, make sure to, to let us know how much you're loving it. I'll come back to, to Chad and, and Jen on a theme I've touched on a few times before I start getting to the audience questions. But we've heard about how unexplored the deep ocean is, how much more we have to learn from it, even in places that we visit often. Right now, there's a kind of global uh, movement to protect more of the ocean, up to perhaps 30% of ocean area by 2030. And I wonder if, if you guys could both um, talk a little bit, doesn't have to be specifically about that target, but about the urgency that we have to protect uh, ocean ecosystems, particularly deep sea ecosystems, so that we can learn from them and discover them. And uh, we've mentioned in this discussion, the connection between the deep sea and climate, but not so much how the climate also threatens deep sea ecosystems. So I wonder if, you know, in the face of these growing threats, climate change, deep sea mining, you can comment on the necessity and urgency of protecting areas of the ocean, um, particularly in, in the deep sea? Um, I, I will say a few things. You know, I, have, I haven't been exploring the deep sea for you know, 25 years. I'm traditionally trained as a kelp forest ecologist. So most of my exploration in the ocean is limited to scuba diving, right? So I'm, I'm usually very close to shore uh, diving scuba. Um, it's been the last 10 years or so really been getting into deep sea exploration. I will say that most people that I talk to, including friends and family, um, things that have become common knowledge to me and to Jen and to others who work in the deep sea clearly aren't common knowledge to, to layperson. I, I understand that. I think sometimes we get into our little world and we think, well, of course people know there are underwater mountains and canyons and complex landscapes and you know uh, hydrothermal vents and cold seeps and you start going on and on and people are like i thought it was just flat mud out there i think that's where people don't make the connection to how dynamic the ocean environment is how many different habitats there are uh, and how 
the oceans really influence, ultimately are the primary drivers of our weather and our climate, you know, in terms of climate change and how much the ocean can absorb in terms of CO2 and heat energy and, and the ice caps and all those things. But I've also seen direct impacts to the deep sea. Again, people go, there's so much water out there. So what if uh, some trash goes out there? Yeah, well, maybe one piece of trash isn't that big of a deal, but you know what? I've seen nuclear waste drums off of San Francisco. I've seen military uh, drones, equipment, submarine trash, cables, wires, and everything down in the Santa Monica, Santa Barbara basin, right? We've seen all sorts of trash, underwater cables, um, you know, bottles, dishwashers, large objects in these really remote areas uh, on the Davidson Seamount and areas in between. Those are just the physical impacts that you can see with the human eye. You wouldn't think you'd come across that much, but you do because humans have been out in the ocean for, you know, obviously centuries, but certainly over the last century with the development um, of, of technology and, you know, more people getting out in the ocean. But there's a lot of the little things we don't see, like the, uh, you know, uh, uh, ocean acidification where the pH of the oceans are rising and we see direct indications of that shell bearing organisms that can't produce shells as easily down in the deep sea because they're only tolerable to very small changes in pH. Um, there's microplastics, which we have been involved with. We've sampled uh, deep sea sediment two miles down, mud and water two miles down. And it had microplastics and fire retardants and PCBs and DDT and all of these or, or, organic chemicals and pesticides that humans have produced, that's all in the food chain. We've sampled at the surface of the ocean, found ridiculous amounts of microplastics there, fibers, little micro balls, all sorts of things that are being consumed by animals and going up the food chain. We have an incredible impact on the oceans right now. I think that's why it's imperative that we are able to set aside larger areas of the ocean so they're not impacted in the same uh, physical regards with like overfishing, or scraping of the seafloor or deep sea mining or effluent, you know, tossing your garbage out, those kinds of things. Uh, but obviously that ties into what we do on land too with, you know, how much water is released, how water is treated, how much we litter because so much blows out into the ocean or gets transported to the deep sea via oceans and creeks and rivers. Obviously I could go on and on. The bottom line is I've seen, and I know Jen's seen direct physical and invisible impacts to the ocean. And I think it's what the common person just doesn't see. And so it is alarming at times to see this. And to me, it's imperative that we accelerate and increase protection of the oceans. I, I totally agree with what Chad has said. Um, and protections, um, some of those protections are the actual physical like spatial protections where you're thinking about impacts to um, of mining or other things that could remove, you know, animals that um, have a long life like corals and sponges or other things that are hard to, will take a long time to replace. Um, and then there's other protections that Chad was alluding to that will help protect the deep sea, but those are behavioral changes that need to occur elsewhere. Um, because as, as he's saying, waters, these waters are moving and they're, they're, um, even if the activity is not occurring over, say, the sea mountain area where we've been studying, um, the waters may be bringing the product of that activity to the seafloor where it then will remain. Um, so the microplastics and other debris that are not being generated, you know, from activities in the sea mountain area, but those that are adjacent. And in fact, I think people think again, remote, but along the California coast, we have these things called submarine canyons, and they're actually a a deep sea delivery service. So sediments um, and um, kind of accumulate from rivers or, or sand movement at the head of these canyons. And then there'll be um, these periodic flows of, of those sediments down the canyon and whatever's in those sediments will also go down into the deep sea. So that's one way that say pesticides that are used on land can end up um, thousands of feet down in the ocean. So when we think about how we use um, our land and the activities that we do on land, uh, it's not just our coastal areas that we're protecting by changing those, but it kind of um, perpetuates throughout 
of the systems of the ocean when we make these changes. So there's the spatial protections that are important as well as behavioral changes that are really important too. Yeah, so important to note that the, there's the spatial element and um, what, what other policies and, and personal behavior impacts there are on the deep ocean. I'll note we need more for... research because the things we're talking about, knowing the pe those deep, those contaminants are in the sediments and those plastics are in the contaminants, we only just collected those samples in the last few years with these cruises. It was unknown um, in a report that we did just not that long ago. We couldn't even evaluate the set the, the contaminant levels and the water quality out there because no, we've never been able to look. So we need to have the ability to do the deep sea research too. Pretty stark. And I'll just note for our audience, there's deep sea areas uh, near the shore that are um, able to be explored, but there's also about two thirds of the ocean, 64%, that's beyond any national jurisdiction, beyond 200 nautical miles. And that's even less understood, uh, even less explored. And there's uh, not a way to create comprehensive protections, spatial uh, based protections in those areas. So important to follow those international policy elements that also uh, you know, will impact our ocean for many years to come. Um, we're getting some questions from the audience, so I'll turn to those now. The first one, John, is for you. What's your next ocean film uh, project that you'd want to get into, or what ideas do you have in mind for your next ocean film? Oh, there, there are lots. There are so many issues going on. I'm not an activist in that sense, but um, I, I love working with scientists. I love working with the ocean. Uh, my wife is a marine turtle biologist. She has uh, several uh, sea turtle projects uh, around the, the, the world that she, she manages. Um, and uh, so I'm very partial to sea turtles. I, I will take on uh, sea turtle projects. Um, there is a lot of um, talk about uh, deep sea mining Deep sea mining, uh, ocean as acidification, uh, deoxygenation. Those are some themes that I'd really like to uh, work on next. It's very difficult to, to bring these types of, of uh, subjects to, to a general audience, though, I, I have to say. You know, broadcasters don't typically like to say, oh, okay, let's, let's do a film about deoxygenation. Um, there has to be a story there, and that's where working with scientists and and having having the access is really really important, and and having that relationship with the scientists. Um, filmmaking is not uh, something that is an easy process. It is you're in it for the long term, and so you have to build relationships. People have to want to work with you. Yeah, and. Uh... It's, it's quite an endeavor to try to explain six syllable words to an audience through, through the media. So, um, but those are important. Yes, e e even saying sustainable too many times might uh, turn an audience off. Yeah, and de deoxygenation is definitely a mouthful. Deoxygen. <laughs> for, for our audience, as the ocean chemistry changes, water warms, uh, and other factors are leading to less oxygen content in the water. And as carbon dioxide dissolves in seawater, the water becomes more acidic, impacting animals that need to build shell, shells to live. Um, I have a couple more questions uh, here for Jennifer. What's the most exciting uh, thing that you've seen throughout your time uh, in ocean exploration? And it might be the octopus garden, but uh, I'll leave it to you. Well, I, I, it's hard to choose between the octopus garden and the whale fall. It really is. They're so different, um, but both um, unexpected. Um, it, it, it's like Chad said, you know, getting to work with this uh, deep sea exploration, it's like, um, you know, Christmas Eve or, you know, right before your birthday and you're excited to see, you know, what's gonna, what's gonna, um, be inside your present because every time we go out there something exciting and, and new is found so those those two it's been every year I look forward to uh, getting to work um, on this because like Chad it's the only time I really get to focus much on deep sea um, and so I've been learning a ton and I 
I, I think that there's both the discovery and then just the intense learning and those things together really make it um, exciting and fun for me. So um, yeah, I'd say those, those two things are tied for me. And Chad, what can all of us do to help uh, you know, bolster the National Marine Sanctuary System, make sure these protections are in place and learn more and better understand them? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I know that <laughs> the PR people would probably answer much better than me. Um, but for me, it's really about um, uh, uh, education about the sanctuary system. Um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's like underwater national parks. It is and it isn't. Um, but we want to make sure more people understand what we are trying to protect. And it's not like we have a bunch of rangers out there saying you can't and can't do these things. It's more about educating the public in what resources exist out there and how they can participate in helping to protect those areas. And it's really hard for, you know, the common person to, quote, protect the sanctuary. But by informing their friends and their family about the sanctuary system. Hey, why don't you check out this film called The Octopus Garden, you know? Or why don't you go to the website? Or why don't you, if they're close to shore, if they're in a coastal community in Central California to participate in a coastal cleanup or uh, a team ocean where they go out with kayaks and educate other people about don't bother the marine mammals. You gotta stay away from them. Every little bit helps, you know, even down to um, you know, not using plastic straws and, and not littering and, and all those kinds of things. Uh, but in the end, I really just think it's about educating themselves about um, the sanctuary system and others. We have 14 national marine sanctuaries um, in, our, in our entire system throughout the nation. And I think a lot of people, again, friends and family that I, I know are, are continually surprised uh, by that. And they'll say things like, oh, you work for the Monterey Bay Aquarium, right? And I'm like, no, it's Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. So there's a lot of those challenges that it, it's, it's hard because the sanctuaries themselves are by nature in the water and underwater, most of it. Um, so it's not like going to Yosemite or Yellowstone or your local state park. It, it, you can't just go hiking or, or take a trip with your dog or your kids. It is a little bit more difficult. So there's that a little bit of disconnect to try and get people a little bit more engaged and involved and want to be able to, to protect. So really just comes down to uh, knowledge, right? Awareness, knowing about the sanctuary system, that in itself is gonna go a long way. And I think- Well, the film like this that John has put together, uh, it does so much to help create that connection, um, like Chad's talking about, because when you're in the beach and you look out, I, I mean, people I think are really impacted by the ocean and they feel a strong affinity to it, but it also feels mysterious. Um, and they don't necessarily know what's out there. And um, we were trying to um, break down that mystery in, in different ways. And a film like this is, is so important for that. I think a lot of people think that the, the one exploration frontier is space, but in fact, like the ocean is right here and it is a incredible opportunity for discovery and exploration. And I'd love to just see more and more um, excitement and um, support for understanding our oceans better. Uh, that's and I think also with the you know film festivals like the International Ocean Film Festival, it has a, a an, an amazing selection of uh, uh, films that span uh, large themes. I mean, it's amazing that an octopus film generates this kind of. Um, conversation. We're talking about climate change. We're talking about uh, the condition of the ocean. We're talking about what different institutions do in order to do their research. Um, there's, it's a, it's a very rich environment. And uh, what the Ocean Exploration Trust is also doing with, with uh, the Nautilus and live streaming, that is, that is uh, remarkable, remarkable what technologies and things can only get better. Yep. Well, that's a, it's a great thought to see the ocean as an next frontier as a conversation starter to learn about so many different issues. As Chad said, we can't quite go, although it'd be amazing to go on a hike up Davidson Seamount, up those 8,000 feet, seeing octopus gardens and corals and sponges that have lived thousands of years. Can't quite do that, but we can see it from the ROVs and from the explorations that uh, that Chad and Jennifer and many others are leading. 
Uh, we're at the top of the hour, so I'll close out the live stream. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Chad, Jennifer, and John, if you don't mind staying on for a little bit, uh, we'll keep you on the Zoom line.